Let's pray. Oh Lord, your grace and your mercy that you gave to us freely to save sinners, to reconcile sinners to yourself, to bring us into fellowship with one another in this institution called the church, your church. Lord, there is much instruction that you've given to the church. You shed your blood for the church. She is your bride. May we have hearts that listen well. May we be transformed as we further understand your church and what part we have in it, that we may be fortified in it. Lord, I pray you just bless tonight and this evening as we walk through the book of 1 Timothy. In Jesus, it is always in your great name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Tonight, we are continuing our 66 book study with the book of 1 Timothy. This is when we take a book of the Bible and we preach an entire sermon all on just one book, and tonight that is the book of 1 Timothy. So please open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Again, that's 1 Timothy chapter 1. This book is the first of what are called the pastoral epistles. This moniker was given in the first part of the 18th century and represents uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. These were so named because of the specific pastoral duties that are contained within them. As we get started, we're going to go through some background information that's going to be helpful for us as we go through this book and through next, actually the next two weeks, uh, 2 Timothy and Titus. Starting with the author, obviously uh, looking at verse 1, the author is the Apostle Paul. He wrote 13 of the epistles found in the New Testament, four of which are addressed specifically to individuals, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. The recipient of this, the first recipient, the primary recipient of this letter is found in verse 2, and it's a man named Timothy, as is stated. But who is Timothy? Who is Timothy? To understand that, we need to go back towards the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. And at the end of, the, of Acts chapter 15, Paul and Silas set off on the second missionary journey and were traveling through Syria and Cilicia. And then they came to the cities of Derbe and Lystra, which were within the Galatian region. That happened about 51 AD. Go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Verse 1, now Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to leave with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew his father was a Greek. Timothy was a disciple. He was a believer likely converted under Paul's first missionary journey through the Galatian region, perhaps five years earlier, around 46 AD. He was the product of a mixed marriage. His mother, Eunice, was a devout Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well-known and had a good reputation among believers in multiple cities in the area. And Paul wanted Timothy to join him on his ministry endeavors, so he took him, had him circumcised, and from that point forward, and for the next roughly 15 years, he became a very close associate companion, fellow worker, and beloved son of the Apostle Paul. From the book of Acts, we know that Timothy was a significant part of Paul's second and third missionary journeys. He would be with Paul in some cities, left behind by Paul in other cities, set ahead of Paul to other cities. He would come and go as needed and directed. Of Paul's 13 epistles, 10 of them specifically mention Timothy. Six of the 10 have him listed on the from part of the salutation. Paul and Timothy to the church at Corinth. Paul and Timothy to the saints at Philippi. Paul and Timothy to the saints at Colossae. Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church at the Thessalonians, twice. And Paul and Timothy to Philemon. Two of the ten, first and second Timothy, he's the recipient of the letter. With such a prominence in the early church, the natural question is, what was Timothy's role? And this is important for us to know. We know from scripture that Timothy had many responsibilities. He reminded the church, churches of Paul's ways. He preached and taught Christ. He was sent out to report on the condition of the churches. 
He was also sent to strengthen and encourage the faith of the churches. He was to teach, preach, and instruct, to give attention to the public reading of Scripture, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. These were pastoral responsibilities. But he was not in the office of a pastor, elder, or shepherd in the local church. He was shepherding as what I would like to call an apostolic delegate or apostolic emissary. William Hendrickson Hendrickson says it this way. Timothy and Titus were not pastors in the usual present-day sense of the term. They were not ministers of local congregations. They were Paul's special envoys or deputies sent by him on specific missions. They were entrusted with concrete assignments according to the need of the hour. Their task was to perform their spiritual ministry here or there, carrying forward the work which had been started, and then reporting to the apostle their findings and accomplishments. So Timothy was the obvious primary recipient of this letter, but I think it's pretty clear there was a second recipient of this letter as well, and that's the Ephesian church. Paul's intent was that Timothy would use this letter to teach the church at Ephesus. He specifically provides multiple commands throughout the letter for Timothy to teach and to prescribe and to instruct these things, the very contents of this letter. Paul also ends the letter, this letter first Timothy, with grace be with you. And the you found there is the plural form. It'd be like saying, grace be with y'all. And I think it's pretty clear that the entire church is in view. So where, where are Paul? Where was Paul when he wrote this? And where's Timothy? Verse three says that Paul was likely somewhere in Macedonia and perhaps Philippi. And Timothy was in Ephesus, which leads us to the next question. When was this letter written? That's a great question, and it's an important question, and so I'll take a little bit of time to explain it. To answer this question, we need to consider if Paul was released from his Roman imprisonment at the end of the book of Acts. The traditional view is that Paul was, in fact, released from prison after the end of what is recorded in the book of Acts and was later re-imprisoned in Rome and subsequently executed. This is the traditional view and what I believe is the correct view, and there are many good reasons to advocate for this view, but we're only going to consider three of them here tonight. First was the optimism concerning a release from prison in Rome. At the end of the book of Acts, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, you can turn there if you want, or you can just listen. Now Paul stayed two full years in his own rented lodging and welcomed all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching things about the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered all openness, unhindered. That's a pretty optimistic ending to the book of Acts. Couple that with two passages from the prison epistles, uh, Philippians and Philemon, which were both written when Paul was in prison in Rome. In Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition, and then dropping down to verse 23, therefore I hope to send him immediately, as soon as I think, see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. Again, a very op- optimistic view of being released from his imprisonment in a short amount of time. Philemon, verse 22, says, At the same time, also prepare me a guest room, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Requesting preparations for a guest room indicates an expected imminent release. There was significant optimism from Paul and the early church that he would be released from Rome and would continue his ministry, missionary endeavors. Second, there are journeys in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy and Titus, that are not recorded within Acts. Luke meticulously captured the details of Paul's, ministry, minish, minish, sorry, Paul's missionary journeys, trials, and Roman imprisonment. However, 1 Timothy describes a time when both Paul and Timothy were in Ephesus, and Paul left Timothy there to go into Macedonia, planning to return to Ephesus. These journeys are not described in the book of Acts, and they don't fit the time constraints of the existing travels that are described within Acts. It seems extremely unlikely that Luke would have omitted these travels and what is recorded in the book of Acts if it had taken place in the same period of time. Similarly, in Titus, the apostle tells Titus to set in order the church in Crete, and make every effort to come to him in Nicopolis. Acts contains no reference to Paul laboring in ministry in Crete with Titus, or having been to Nicopolis. Again, 
This would have been a significant omission on Luke's behalf if these travels had taken place during the time that Acts was written. However, all of these journeys easily can be explained if one presupposes a release from the Roman imprisonment at the end of Acts. And lastly, the pastoral epistles, which presuppose a release and re-imprisonment, being accepted by the early church as authentic and expired, point to an early and strong acceptance of this view. Given all of that, we can now start assigning some dates. The end of the book of Acts happened around 60 to 62 AD, with Paul being released shortly thereafter. That puts the writing of 1 Timothy about 63 AD, prior to Nero's burning of Rome in 64 AD, which started the Roman prosecution, persecution of Christians. With that background information, we're going to get to the purpose, which is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Go ahead, and you can go ahead and turn there. The Apostle Paul says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. There's significant spiritual warfare going on. Satan hates God, hates God's son, hates God's word, hates God's family, which is the church. Paul's not currently in Ephesus, but he is burdened to write to Timothy and to the church to fortify them against satanic influences. Paul wants Timothy to know, and by extension, the church to know how one ought to behave as a member of the family of God, which is the church, the pillar and support of the truth. There are three key themes that are weaved together throughout this book. One is dealing with heresy, false teachers, and false doctrine. The other, uh, the number two, uh, church order and behavior of those within the church. And the third is Timothy's personal conduct as a teacher. And these themes are weaved in and out of the different points that we're going to cover tonight, and they all hang off of this purpose, which brings us to the message. Now we're ready to start talking and walking through that, through the book. The purpose of 1 Timothy is to know how one ought to behave as a member of the family of God, which is the church, the pillar and support of the truth. And to see how this plays out throughout the book of 1 Timothy, we're going to see how God provides five sets of instructions to the church. The first instruction that he provides is instructions concerning false teachers. Let's start reading in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. The Apostle Paul is very familiar with this church. He was there briefly during his second missionary journey. He spent three years there during his third missionary journey. He met the Ephesian elders on his way to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, and he was there after his first imprisonment, from which he left to go into Macedonia, as stated in verse 3. He had roughly a 10-year relationship with these Ephesians. And here in verse 3, the Apostle Paul commands Timothy to remain at Ephesus to combat false teachers and their fa false doctrine. The strange doctrines that they were teaching were not something like the Greco-Roman gods. This is talking about something that is based in truth and has deviated from it. It's diverged from it. It's divisive. And to the untrained ear, it may even sound like truth and be enticing, which makes it, which makes it especially dangerous. This false teaching had a Jewish Christian flavor with a bit of an ascetic streak. Also, these men were teaching false doctrine. The men that were teaching the false doctrine were within the body. They were attached to the body. They were personally known by the church. So Timothy is to give cease and desist orders so that, they are teach, so that those that are teaching contrary, divergent, and divisive doctrine would stop. Verse 5. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 
In contrast to the contrary, diverse, divisive teaching of these men, Paul provides a reminder of his and Timothy's instruction. In a word, love. Their goal is to promote love, a love of God, a love of others, a selfless love, an unhypocritical behavior that demonstrates a sincere faith. Verse 6, For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. These false teachers wanted to be recognized as teachers of the law, but they do not even understand the law. They do not even understand the purpose of the law. Continuing in verse 8, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The law is good if one uses it correctly. The law doesn't make anyone righteous. The purpose of the law is to show sinners their sin and their need for a savior. That's the bad news. And that's where the gospel comes in with the good news. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason, I found mercy. So that in me as foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul explains how he was not just a blasphemer, but a violent persecutor as well. And how he was shown mercy and how the grace of our Lord far exceeded his sin based on faith, and not based on any external conformity to the law. Paul was saved, you were saved, by Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, coming into the world to save you. By going to the cross to bear the wrath of God for the sins, all your sins, based on the trust, your trust and belief in him. Jesus was the substitute that went in place of the sinner. For all those that believe, they get to experience eternal life in the presence of God. That's what we get to look forward to. And rightly does Paul break into adoration, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul then comes back to the charge he gave Timothy and provides encouragement for this difficult task. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith, and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Paul's charge to Timothy that he would remain at Ephesus was to combat false teachers and false doctrine. And this was a very serious and difficult task. Timothy is young. He needs to exert authority over those who are no doubt older and have acquired some kind of following, and desire more influence. These are likely not the type of men who are going to go down without a fight. So Paul provides encouragement with Timothy, you fight the good fight. Paul also disciplines two known false teachers by name that refused correction. Hymenaeus and Alexander both specifically rejected attempts at correction of their false doctrine. Given their refusal to listen and the danger posed by their false teaching, Paul puts them out of the church. The church is the pillar in support of the truth. The truth will always come under attack, and as such, the church will always come under attack, so that Satan can shipwreck people's faith. The church needs to be well-equipped and fortified with truth to recognize and discern false teaching. 
Those are the instructions that Paul gives concerning false teachers. Next, he's going to provide specific instructions concerning the church. So that brings us to our next point, instructions concerning the church. Chapters 2 and 3, Paul provides this instruction, starting in verse, chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Here Paul provides instruction about prayer. When the church gathers corporately, he wants them to include prayer for those that are in authority over them. There's no group of people that are to be excluded based on their vocation, ethnicity, or any other distinction. Why did the Ephesian church need this instruction? Because it would have been tempting to omit prayer for the corrupt, godless, debauched authorities that were over them, with their current emperor leading the way. Nero was, the one, was one of the most brutal dictators of all time, and he was included in this exhortation on prayer. Next, Paul provides instruction regarding the gender roles within the church as they gather. Starting in verse 8, Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. The bottom line here is that men are the authority within the church. As, and as a part of their role in leading the church, they are responsible for leading in prayer and in teaching. Paul explicitly prohibits women from any corporate teaching or authority within the church. So men are supposed to oversee the church, but not just any man. Paul next provides a list of, a list of qualifications for any man aspiring to the office of overseer. In verse, chapter 3, verse 1, is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The term overseer here is synonymous with pastor, elder, and shepherd. They are, they're all used to describe the same office. And here, Paul says that the man must have a desire, he must be able to teach, and he must have godly character. Paul describes the kind of man an elder must be both inside his home and outside of his home. He provides a list of qualifications that a man must be evaluated against for consideration to the office. Man, by themselves, can easily come up with a, a list of leadership criteria that don't align with God's criteria success in business, exceptional speaking skills, popularity and a following, the ability to influence people. These things in and of themselves may expose the church to highly skilled false teachers. So it's important for the church to know the criteria that God uses to qualify a man to lead and to shepherd his church. Godly qualification is not limited to shepherds of the church, but also to the servant layer of leadership called deacons. In verse 8, Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, 
not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And that then brings us to the purpose of the letter in verse 14. I am, I am, Paul says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Paul is intending to return to Timothy and to return to the church at Ephesus after he completes his current ministry endeavors. But in case he's delayed, he wants Timothy and the church to know how one ought to conduct himself, how one ought to behave, how one ought to act within the church within God's family, the pillar and support of the truth. This takes place corporately when we gather together. This takes place individually when we're not around each other. We never stop being a part of God's family and a part of his church. And we, the church, support the truth. We support it as we live it, as we handle it, as we proclaim it. These are the instructions that Paul provides concerning the church. And next, we're going to see he provides instructions concerning apostasy. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. These verses are talking about apostasy, falling away from or departing from the faith. This falling away is not something that happens passively. It is a purposeful, deliberate departure. It's a willful abandonment of the biblical faith that was once professed. These men, with their hypocritical, immoral character, provide a false ascetic teaching with the hope of getting others to abandon their faith. Their asceticism was practicing a strict self-denial and physical discipline in an effort to demonstrate their righteousness for God by being stricter than God. Approximately six years earlier, Paul met with the Ephesian elders on his way to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. Verse, Acts, chapter 29, Acts chapter 20, verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul warns the Ephesian elders that from among themselves, savage wolves will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples. Some subset of these elders were going to be revealed as false teachers, trying to entice those within the church to abandon their faith. Paul continues in 1 Timothy, verse 6, In pointing these things out to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Paul expects Timothy to expose the asceticism of these false teachers to the church. Their self-denial and self-discipline only have limited value 
in the present life. And Paul provides the command for Timothy to discipline and train himself for the purpose of godliness. The outcome of that training has value for life for the life to come. The expectation, expectation that Timothy would be constantly nourished on God's word and be following it, and that he would be training himself for the purpose of godliness, was also an expectation and command for the church. Verse 11 says, to Timothy, Paul to Timothy says, prescribe and teach these things. Paul commands Timothy to teach and prescribe these things, to give these orders to the church. These things referring to the previous verses in verses 6 through 10. Let's continue in verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Play, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear it. Timothy's ministry as an apostolic delegate was not just about preaching and teaching. He was firstly to demonstrate his character as an example to these believers. And then secondarily, he was to preach and teach. The church needed to be aware of the apostate false teachers so that they would know how they are and are not to conduct themselves within the church. And in contrast to that, God graciously provided examples of godly character to follow. These are the instructions Paul gives concerning apostasy. Next, he provides instructions concerning pastoral responsibilities. Paul starts this next section by providing instruction on interactions with different demographics. Chapter 5, verse 1. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father. To younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. It's important for shepherds to know, and really everyone to know, how they are to interact with different demographics within the church family. Older and younger, male and female, within the church. Paul continues with instructions on widow care. Verse 3, honor widows who are widows indeed. Shepherds and the church are to honor widows, to show high regard for them and our care for them. Paul continues with defining which widows are widows indeed and what the widow care is to look like within the immediate family and within the church family picking up in verse 4. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day, but she who gives herself to want and pleasure is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been a wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, and if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires and disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle. They go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them, and the church must not be burdened, so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. The church is to know how it ought to act and how it, to have, and how it is to respect and uh, care for widows. 
The next section, Paul sets expectations and provides instructions with respect to elders. Starting in verse 17. The elders who rule well are, considered, are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. No longer drink water exclusively, but a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. The sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Likewise, also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Given the clear and present danger of false teachers and the warning from Acts chapter 20 about some of the Ephesian elders actually being wolves, this is needed instruction for the church. Paul provides instruction about paying elders, accusing elders, rebuking elders, and provides significant caution when commissioning elders. Next, Paul commands Timothy to preach and teach on slave-master relationships. Chapter 6, verse 1. All who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. A slave within the Roman Empire was very different than a slave within the American chattel slavery institution. And we need to be careful not to read into the New Testament and this passage with our knowledge of the American experience. It's estimated that at one time, one-third of the inhabitants of the Roman Empire were slaves. Given the prevalence of that social class, it's very appropriate and expected that Paul would provide instruction with regard to it so that the church would know they ha- how they were to act. And Paul instructs these believers that they were to respect and honor their masters, even all the more if their masters were believers. Now, in this country, we don't have the institution of slavery, but we can understand these principles with respect to the various authorities that we have in our lives, particularly the employer-employee relationship. Those are instructions that Paul provides concerning pastoral responsibilities. Next, he provides instructions concerning the man of God. Paul starts this next section, starting in verse 3, by setting up a contrast of the false teachers with the man of God. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we, can take, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. False teachers deny truth. They are extremely proud and the results of these things are strife. The market of religious ideas can also pay well and can become a fleshly motivation for, fle- for false teachers. We easily see that in our own day. And as a result of the love of money, some apostatize and depart from the faith. Paul continues by providing a contrast to these false teachers in verse 11. But flee, these, flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, 
faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Paul commands Timothy to flee, to escape from these dangerous things that entice false teachers. He tells them to pursue godly things, namely righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. He further charges Timothy to be faithful to the gospel ministry work that he was called to do. The church needs to be equipped to identify false teachers and to be biblically informed to pursue godly leadership. Next, Timothy is commanded to provide instruction on stewardship. Verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Those in the church that actually have material wealth are to fix their hope on God, not on the accumulation or or protection of what God has already provided. They're also instructed to be rich in good works and generous with God's provision. And finally, Paul closes out the letter with one final command for his delegate. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. Timothy is to guard what has been entrusted to him. He's been given something immensely valuable, and he has to keep it safe. He's been given God's word, and he needs to keep it pure and not contaminated by false teachers or false doctrine. And Paul closes the letter with, grace be with you, or grace be with y'all. Because the you here is the plural form of the Greek, Paul intends this letter to be read and taught to the entire church. And this is an appropriate ending to the letter. Paul pronounces God's grace, God's unmerited favor upon the church. So what do we do with this? Having now walked through the entire letter, those that have known me for a while have probably heard me pose the question, How many churches do you know that have been faithfully proclaiming the gospel for over 40 years? How many come to mind? If you can think of any, it's probably not a very long list. Why is that? Why is that? I'll give you two reasons tonight, and next week when I teach through 2 Timothy, I'll give you another one. Number one, churches have forgotten or perhaps never been taught how one ought to behave as a member of the family of God. God cares about his church. It's the bride of Christ. It's his family. And we've been adopted into his family. And as the head of his family, he has expectations for how we ought to act as a member of his family. First Timothy provides much instruction on specific behaviors with regard to prayer, gender roles, qualifications for leadership, examples of godly character, family relationships within the church, paying elders, accusing elders, rebuking elders, commissioning elders, relationships to authorities, widow care, and stewardship. Grace Bible Church, you must know how one ought to conduct himself within the family of God within God's household. Number two, churches are failing to be the pillar and support of the truth. God cares about truth. It's his truth. 
It's his means of telling us who he is, who we are, our need to be saved, and his provision of a savior. And he doesn't want his truth counterfeited, mishandled, perverted, or misrepresented. False teachers and false doctrines shall have no quarter, no safe haven within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace Bible Church, we must know the truth and fortify fortify ourselves with the truth so that we can participate in the church's responsibility as being a pillar and support of the truth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the church. Thank you for bringing us into your family. Thank you for, for, for providing so much instruction on how we are to act, behave within your church. Thank you for giving us truth. Thank you that we get to proclaim it. Lord, may Grace Bible Church protect and be a pillar in support of truth. Jesus, it is always in your great name we pray. Amen.